Hello, and welcome to this month's episode of Fraud Talk. I'm Courtney Howell, Community Manager at the ACFE. Today, I'm speaking with Simon Marchand, Chief Fraud Prevention Officer at Nuance Communications. Thank you for joining us, Simon. Thanks for having me. Yay, okay, so I'm so glad to have you here today because we're gonna be talking about voice biometrics, which is a bit of a new topic for some people. So to get us started, I was wondering if you could just give us a broad overview of what voice biometrics are and how they're used in the fraud prevention field. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so voice biometrics is a concept that's not necessarily new to the market. It's It's been used for many years, mostly to authenticate individuals that are calling either their banks or their telecommunication company. So voice biometrics is the process by which uh, uh, an algorithm analyzes someone's voice to try and detect up to a thousand different parameters and build a voice print of that individual's voice. So we're looking at a voice print the same way we'd be looking at a fingerprint, for example. It's something that makes you, you, it's completely unique to you. Um, and it's a, it's a complex formula that then creates kind of a line of code that we use to then match any subsequent calls that you would make or any other speech that you would try to, to have. And we can match that to the voice print we have on file to make sure that we are indeed talking to the person we're expecting. Cool. And so when you're thinking about fraud prevention, fraud detection in general, how are people using this and how are they using voice biometrics in that way? Yeah. So obviously there's the whole authentication side of things where uh, we will use voice biometrics to make sure that when a customer calls in or, or when we, we're looking at someone's voice or, or someone's recording, we're, we're looking at the right person. It comes into play in fighting fraud when we start using voice biometrics to uh, either identify a fraudster's voice, so we're trying to identify someone calling back that we know is a known fraudster that hit our organization in the past, or when we use it uh, in an investigation to try and tie multiple different cases of fraud to one individual or to a small number of individuals who might have colluded to hit organizations. Uh, it, it is a technology that's being used in forensic science for uh, a couple of years now, um, so it is also something that can be used uh, in more high profile cases when it comes to identifying uh, someone who's speaking on a video and we can see that in some public investigations on uh, terrorist threats, for example. Uh, so it can be used in multiple ways, but it, it, in fighting fraud, the most common way in telcos and banks, for example, will be to make sure that when someone calls, if it's not the individual we are recognizing, we'll be able to match that person to a known database of fraudsters and make sure that we do not deal with that person. Oh, that's cool. So it's kind of got two different sides. There's one that's for the customer and the client calling in just to make sure it's them and give them that security. But then there's also kind of this other side to it where you can actually find links between fraudsters. That's really cool. Yeah, and we can also use it to try and detect new potential attacks uh, on accounts. So, of course, if you know a specific fraudster, you can look for that person, but sometimes someone will be hitting for the first time. And, and we're able, using voice biometrics, to, for example, identify if one specific voice uh, has tried to call in 10, 20, 50 times in a day trying to impersonate different individuals. So we are able to cluster all of those calls and be able to say, well, you know what, this one voice tried to call and impersonate multiple individuals, which we think is suspicious and should be investigated. So we can also try and use that to detect new fraudsters that might not already be in our databases. That's really cool and very exciting. It sounds like it's a very powerful tool for banks and organizations like that. So I kind of want to, like, that's on the fraud prevention side. I'm curious as what it looks like from the your client side or the customer side. Like, how are they integrating this into their systems and what does that look like? Well, there's two two ways to, to proceed when, when you implement voice biometrics. So uh, obviously the goal of voice biometrics being to remove all sorts of security questions or personal information from the call, uh, we can go and use your voice as a password. So that's what we call um, active detection, where you would be prompted by your bank to say, well, at bank ABC, my voice is my password. And that little snippet of speech is enough for us to be able to make sure that it is indeed the right person. 
Um, but it does put some kind of friction where you still have to go through kind of a password process, even though that password is just a sentence that's very common. Uh, so there is the other aspect of voice biometrics when we use it passively. And that's happening in the conversation that you as a customer will have with your agent or with whoever is on the other side uh, of the call. And as you're speaking, we're able to match that live speech to whatever we have in the database to that expected voice print and be able to tell, regardless of the language you're using, uh, regardless of if you have a cold or not, but we're able to tell that this uh, speech, that person that's speaking to us is the right person. So we don't have, we don't need a predefined sentence. We are, we're not looking for specific words. We're really looking at the characteristics of your voice. So how does it sound? What's the, the tone, the pitch? Does it come from the nose, from the throat? And all of this can be picked up by the algorithm live. So it removes all sorts of friction in the authentication process for the customer. It's completely transparent for them. Oh, awesome. Um, that brought up two questions for me, but I'll go with the first one that I, I came up with. You said it's passive, so it's kind of just going on in the background. Uh, will our organizations like asking their customers, is, is this okay? Do they get their consent? Or is it just something that they they just put out there and are using in the background without people knowing? No, of course, you, we would never recommend that this kind of um, procedure is put in place without having explicit consent. And uh, so at, at Nuance, when we deploy those solutions with our customers, that's one of the first things we tell them. So you will have to build a specific script for your agents to make sure that you obtain explicit consent. So the way it will usually work is that the customer will be calling the first time, uh, will be answering, you know, the traditional like date of birth, address, mother's maiden name and whatnot. And at the end of the call, then the agent can offer uh, that the client uh, saying, well, you know what, we could avoid having to ask you all of these questions uh, if you would accept that your voice is enrolled and used for future identification. Um, and when the customer agrees, then we can move on and use that voice print of the conversation that happened to then build the voice print. And in the future, when that person calls back, it's completely transparent and we can avoid all of the security questions. But we do have to get explicit consent. And I think this is key in an era where people are more and more concerned with their privacy and we're having all those smart assistants in our houses and there is a growing concern. Like, are they listening to us when we don't want them to? So that open and transparent relationship between a business and its customers when it comes to enrolling in voice biometrics is fundamental for us. That's good. I'm sure a lot of people will be reassured by that. Because, <laughs> um, you know, you hear other stories of, oh, how you hold your phone when you're signing into your app is a fraud detection method. And you're like, what? They're, they're just recording all this information. So um, that's really good to know. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and what you're mentioning there is important because obviously voice biometrics, we've been talking about it in the call center um, area. But biometrics as a whole is uh, clearly the next step when it comes to fighting fraud and what you're mentioning, like behavioral biometrics, how you hold your phone, which angle, how you type. Uh, same thing for your, your, your computer. Like how are you using the mouse, the trackpad? Are you uh, hitting keys a specific way? Are you navigating on a portal a specific way? All of this is biometrics information. And if you're going to use that, well, your customers should be aware of it. And we do have that omni-channel approach where we say, and we're very conscious that if we have strong controls on the call centers, fraudsters will move to the digital channel, which is understandable and obviously like it's their business. So that's why when we work with our customers, we make sure that we implement our technology on all the different channels. So we're able to use that voice biometrics uh, in a phone app, for example, we're able to use our behavioral biometric uh, algorithms on the phone, on the PC, like I said, uh, we're able to use uh, other types of biometrics such as the conversation print, where we will look at how you structure your sentences, the choice of words, and we can use that to match it with how you type if you're having a chat conversation with an agent. So if if your the structure of your sentences or how you build your ideas changes dramatically, we're also capable of, see, of saying, well, this is not Courtney, this is not how she usually speaks, or how she usually types or, or constructs uh, sentences. And then we can raise alarms, we can raise uh, any sorts of cases for fraud analysts to start looking into that. So voice biometrics is really one step, but biometrics in general in fighting fraud just becomes kind of that 
holistic, integrated approach that can be put on all the channels of an organization. Yeah, that kind of ties into the other question I had of how difficult is it or would it be for a fraudster to steal someone's voice and or make a synthetic voice that sounds like someone? How would that work? Well, that, that would be uh, by today's standards with the technology that's available right now to fraudsters, that, that would be quite complex. So there are solutions that are available and that, that uh, anyone can try. Uh, one good example is Liarbird, um, where they ask you to speak 30 predefined sentences, so specific sentences, and then they use those 30 recordings to let you type in a message and have your synthetic voice uh, speak that message. So obviously, uh, at Nuance, we're not only looking at identifying real voices, but we also have algorithms running in the back to try and identify, well, is it a recording of someone's voice? Is it a synthetic voice? Is it robotic? Um, and that work that's done by a team of scientists here, and we're looking at 300 scientists working in Nuance, so it's a big team. Um, we're constantly working to try and detect what would be a synthetic voice with the, the new technologies that are coming. So we've been hearing about deep fakes. Uh, we're starting to hear about deep voices. Obviously, fraudsters will go this way because as companies will adopt biometrics uh, as a security measure, fraudsters will try and go around it. So we're making sure that we develop our technology to be able to identify synthetic voices in the future. But the reality is that today, for a fraudster to sample an individual's voice would require a lot of work and effort on their end because we're still expecting uh, specific words, specific sentences to be pronounced. So th the scheme around that would be very complex and probably not worth the trouble considering that they can get a new identity for 15, 20, 30 bucks on the dark web. So right now we don't see it, but we're well aware of the future risks and we're working to make sure that we will detect that. That makes me kind of think about, you're talking about identity and how easy it is to buy uh, personal identifying information on the dark web now. And it seems, you know, obviously that biometrics are very tied to someone's ID and that can be scary for some people. So um, with the data security landscape, how it is, where do you see biometrics fitting into that? And like, how do organizations alleviate people's fears that they're protecting this very, very personal data, even more so than your social security number? Yeah, well, I think that we have to start looking into as consumers into using uh, information that that is ours that cannot be replicated easily or purchased. So PII, passwords, all of this, it's 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 less and less efficient, and we see that it's available for cheap on the dark web. So using biometrics is just for us as consumers an additional layer, and a layer that's going to be very difficult to, to market. And that being said, once your voice print is taken by a company and stored on their servers, uh, it's not something that can be reverse engineered. We're not storing your voice uh, Technically speaking, we're storing a code that represents your voice print, and that code is hashed and encrypted. And if someone was to retrieve that information and unencrypt it, they couldn't do anything with it. They, they, they couldn't hear what your voice is supposed to be or reverse engineer a voice from that code. We're really taking the, the, the audio sample to try and build uh, a text version or an encoded version of what we expect it to be with all the characteristics. So th that makes it very safe for consumers and they, they can be assured that when they're dealing with serious partners in voice biometrics, um, their voice cannot be reverse engineered from the voice print that's being kept. Yeah, cool. That definitely makes sense. But what about, you know, there's different data laws in different countries. Do you see biometrics being accepted at different rates or in a different way in different regions? Yeah, there are, so obviously there's different laws everywhere that we have to, to work with. And some services that we offer uh, in North America, for example, where we allow uh, voice prints to be shared uh, between partners to try and track fraudsters 
quicker, and we're talking about fraudsters' voice prints here, uh, those services are not available everywhere. Obviously, uh, in Europe with the GDPR and all the very heavy regulation around privacy, uh, there are restrictions to what services can be offered there. But there is a strong interest, regardless of where you look uh, in the world. The only difference is that it takes additional steps when you want to implement that in your business. You have to go through special counsels. You have to explain how you're going to collect that information. You have to prove that you're going to have that explicit consent. Uh, you have to demonstrate how you're going to handle uh, those voice prints. And if someone wants to withdraw their consent, how it's going to work. But it's always possible to have some level of voice biometrics to be implemented for most of the countries in the world. And we work with our customers to make sure that what they're putting in place uh, will be, of course, relevant to what they're trying to achieve, but also be done respecting all laws and regulations in place. So that's why we stay very transparent with the customers. We stay very transparent when it comes to disclosing that voice is being used, just to make sure that we will not um, have a problem with any regulations in place. Awesome. So this is such an exciting field and I, I love learning about all the biometric stuff and the ACFE with SAS is actually going to release a benchmarking report for technology in the fraud field and one of the things we're looking at are how people are using biometrics and we're kind of seeing who's planning to use this in the future or who's not planning to use it at all. I would love to know some of your predictions or things that you could see happening in the next few years with voice biometrics. Voice biometrics has been deployed in uh, a lot of the big banks around the world and just from the nuance side we're looking at uh, 500 enterprises uh, using it already and we're, we're talking big enterprises here 400 million voice prints across the world so it is a growing technology just because and as we said it before PII and passwords um, are less and less effective at protecting customers so banks have to look at what's the next step and that next step uh, in many cases is biometrics so voice and behavioral uh, are good examples so we see it growing um, there, ha there are issues uh, where you have to make sure that not only your fraud team is on board, but your customer experience team is on board. And it usually involves so many people in a business that it might take a little more time than other uh, security measures or authentication methods. But we do see a growing interest in there. And I think that we can stay with the security measures that we've seen for the past 10 years. Um, Two-factor authentication uh, has shown that it, it is not as efficient as we thought it was. Relying on telcos to protect bank accounts uh, is not a reliable way to do it, just because we've seen how SIM swaps are now a huge problem, especially in North America. Uh, so, so the only way to really protect customers from account takeovers, from subscription fraud, and to make sure that our, our identities are not used uh, by fraudsters who purchase them off the web is, is to add that additional layer that very personal information that is your voice print or your conversation print or your behavioral print to your identity. So we're just adding on to that to make sure that we make it harder and harder for fraudsters to, uh, to hit consumers. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been so informative and so interesting. And thank you so much for talking with us about this today. You're very welcome. Remember, you can find more episodes of Fraud Talk at acfe.com slash podcast. This is Courtney Howell signing off.